how do we get past talking about the difference to actually being what we all are hoping for, which is one, and, and looking like it is in some other countries? A lot of you that go to Europe are like, man, it's, it's a bit different in Europe. That's because they abolished the slave trade in 1803. We didn't abolish it until we fought a war in 1865. <laughs> Black people have been a lot freer in Europe for a lot longer. Not only that, but they didn't have Jim Crow in Europe. I mean, we, we just, we forget. I remember telling an African-American friend like, hey, the Declaration of Independence, yes, it, it didn't include black people, but it was a necessary step on the way to getting freedom for black people. And he says, how's that? The British outlawed it in 1803. If, if the colonies had stayed British, I'd have been free 50 years earlier, right? Like there's a whole lot of this stuff that we're like, oh wait, I never really realized that, right? So Europe has been much more integrated a lot longer. Bob Jones University, you, in the 80s, you still couldn't interracially marry, in the 80s, right? So we have a very recent history of race. And so I think the idea is we want to get to that point where we don't have to necessarily talk about it, but what what a lot of, and by the way, no color in America is monolithic, right? I mean, we know that, but I, I might have a white friend, I might have an African-American friend, I might have an Asian-American friend. All of those communities are incredibly diverse and they disagree with each other as much as they agree with each other, right? No, no culture or race is monolithic. Um, but the, the people that are saying, I, I have to speak out for, for this, it's because they they are experiencing that there are differences and those differences are often along racial lines and often um, creating or perpetuating um, a bias in society. Let me, let me just really step on it here. Um, Facebook pictures with white people in Africa with a whole lot of African ch children. Have you ever seen them? Anybody not seen them? How come, how come we all don't run into the kids' ministry on a Sunday morning and go, kids, look at these happy kids. I'm going to take a selfie with these kids, and I'm going to post it. Look at me with all these fun kids. Or the nursery. Hey, I'm in the nursery today. Look at all these crying babies, but they're cute. Let me take a picture of myself with these babies. But we go to Africa, and the very first thing we do is get a, a picture where we're the white person in the middle of a sea of black kids, and we immediately make that our, our Facebook profile. Why? Because somehow in a very subtle way, I don't think we realize we're doing this, but what we're really doing is going, I feel important here. There's all these black faces and they're cute and I'm the, this white person kind of in the middle that looks, that looks big and altruistic and in charge and good and, and, and so we put it up with all these good intentions, but what we don't realize is all our African-American friends are going, are we, a, are we a brood of Labrador retrievers that you jump into the middle and get a picture because it's cute? Like, but you won't do that with white kids. What, what is subtly going on in, in, in how you perceive the difference with, with black skin with you in the middle of it that all of a sudden makes that such a hot ticket that you want to post that picture? And, and there's just these subtle ways that there is a difference and that we, we live into it. And... and and don't realize some of the ways that we hurt other people. And, and, and someone's going to look at that and go, I feel cheapened. As if the color of my skin makes me a novelty. Because I see what you're doing. And I know you don't mean it bad. But you're subtly introducing this power differential where white's on top and, and black serves to spotlight that. Or to make it look cute. Um, and so there are differences in America, uh, Ancestry.com. My mom loves Ancestry.com, you know? Isn't this great? You can go back to the 1100s and learn about your family unless you're black. And somehow it just seems to stop at about four generations. So it's a fun game for us white people. Or Ancestry.com has a thing right now on Facebook that if you, if you hit the button, it'll grab your last name and it'll tell you something about your heritage. You're Scottish, you know? That name Knox comes from Scotland, blah, blah, blah. Unless you're African-American and you punch it in and they're like, oh, you're French. Uh, no, no. 
But my great-great-granddaddy worked for a French slave master and was slapped with that last name. So even the fun little games we play on the internet with, with let's talk about our identity and isn't this fun to see our heritage, at every turn, African-Americans are reminded you somehow have mattered less because of the color of your skin. Implicit, so in what we don't realize is we think that it's all ended in 1964 when the South and, and the whole segregation was dismantled. And, and what we don't understand is that when explicit racism out here went away, it just went underground and it's what's called implicit racial bias. So an implicit memory is when I walk out of the library and I got a book in my knapsack and that alarm with the gate, it goes off and I kind of freak out like, whoa, you know, and my heart races and all this stuff and my body gets really hot and fight or flight is going on. And, you know, I have to run back. Like, I didn't mean to steal this. Like, I thought I checked it out, you know, whatever it is. A, a month, two months later, I go there. I don't even have a backpack. Don't even have a book in my hands. I have nothing. Um, and I'm going to walk through that gate again, and all of a sudden my heart races, my, my body temperature goes up, and I'm kind of like a little bit afraid. If you were like me, um, I'll be driving home from church on a Sunday with my four kids in the car after preaching a sermon, and I see a police car, and, and all of a sudden I'm like, you know, quick, I gotta pull over, kids, duck. Like, because in college, I did a lot of bad things. And so I, 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 I have this memory, this, this button, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with me. I'm going like 10 miles under the speed limit. I'm, you know, but somehow there's something in me and that's called an implicit memory. We know them as buttons. Like, why did you freak out when I said that? And it has nothing to do with me or what I said, but your granddaddy or your daddy used to say something to you a long time ago. And when I said this, it hit that button. Does that make sense? It's called an implicit memory. Psychosomatic, whatever you want to call it. Implicit racial bias is that through socialization, I have implicit memories that are racial. And so when there's an input, it gets an output. I don't necessarily think about it, it's just hitting a button, just like when I walk through that gate. And there's a lot of implicit racial bias in society. Why when Trayvon Martin was killed by George Zimmerman, even, even though George Zimmerman was brown, I, most of the white people I knew, and there were studies on this, if you put the two of them there and said, in bed when you're thinking about what happened, most white people um, put themselves in George Zimmerman's shoes and experienced it as this black man beating me and I'm about to lose my life. You have two people to choose. Uh, one, the guy that was being stalked by a vigilante. Um, the other guy, the vigilante, that we now know, uh, now that we've had a couple years to look at his character and some of the other things he's done, is kind of a, a crazy guy. Um, and you have a choice. Who are you, who, who you going to more naturally find yourself like experiencing it through. And somehow we all dove this way and it's because subtly we have a very hard time empathizing or with experiencing things through this lens when someone has black skin. Um, and there's plenty of studies that show this. Even black people have implicit racial bias against black skin. It's really insidious. It's very deep and we have brought it about and it goes way far back. When you ask, how come the black home is in such turmoil? Where are the dads? Well, where did that begin? It began when we started breaking families up all the way up until the 1860s. Because once the Slave Trade Act happened in 1803, um, we weren't getting our slaves from Africa anymore. Where were we getting them from? We were breeding them and selling them on slave markets, but it was an internal market. So the whole thing was built on splitting families up. And so we go, man, what the heck is wrong with these black families? And we're like, no, we actually began that process. Not only that, but we had unjust sentencing laws in the, in the 70s and 80s with regard to drugs. My sister wrote a whole law review on this that's been cited by the Supreme Court. But, you know, same people, and these people are, are being incarcerated at a higher level and for a lot longer. And when you take the teenagers and 20-somethings of a demographic and you pull them all the way out, some of them that have kids, reintroduce them a lot later because they've got long sentences, way different than the college fraternity boy, and you introduce them back in and now they have a record 
and they can't get a job, and they can't vote, and they don't get federal benefits. They can't live in federal housing. They can't apply for you know, food stamps because they have a record. And, and we begin to go, why is the black family in turmoil? Well, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of them. And, and so the differences are there. We, we, we're socialized with inequality. Um, and I, I could give 100 examples of seeing it, my African-American friends could give hundreds of thousands of examples of experiencing it. Um, and so it just exists. And so the people that are saying, like, how do you get Newt Gingrich saying, yep, um, you look at that video and, and you, you definitely have the thought that if that guy's skin color was white, he it probably wouldn't have resulted in that shooting. We switch gears and talk about mass murderers. There's a picture out there uh, of about 29 guys in orange jumpsuits, right? They're all people that killed uh, more than one people, what we call mass murderers, and they're all white. And we somehow took them all alive. Um, and so you begin to realize subtly implicit racial bias and the fear of black bodies does it create a condition, not where I intend to kill somebody, not where I'm thinking, oh, I'm a racist and I want to kill that person because of their skin, but does it create the climate where my response could be different than it would otherwise? And, and the answer is somehow, some way, it does. We're not trained as white people to go before the policeman gets to your door, get your, your ID out, have your hands where they can see them with the ID in it. Don't wait till someone gets to the door to reach for your, your wallet because that can, honestly, to a police officer putting his life on the line, that can be perceived as a threat. And if the more heightened he is that you might be a threat, the more he's gonna perceive that as a threat. So you take all that away and, and here's kind of some of the things you can, uh, you know, I don't know too many white kids that have been coached on how to reach into the glove box or reach into your pocket. And it doesn't make, it doesn't make policemen racist. It doesn't make this racist. It means our culture suffers from implicit racial bias where difference does matter. So I agree with you. It, that is the problem. But the answer is we find the people that are giving their lives to work for, uh, for it and towards it. By the way, the Dallas Police Department is, is lauded as one of the best at having done things with regard to this issue, which is why it's so, it, oh my gosh, it is a tragedy that anyone loses their life, especially people putting their life on the line for other people. But you have police departments that are doing fantastic jobs. You have people, policemen out there that are doing fantastic jobs. You have a lot of people that are working towards it and, and bridging the gap. And the idea would be um, it's easy for us, us being the people not as affected by this to say, why can't we just all get over it? Because we're not the ones necessarily experiencing it. What we should be doing is saying the policemen that are amazing that are working towards this, the pastors that are amazing and working towards this, the, the, the scholars and the theologians that are amazing and trying to help with this, the truly nonviolent persons that are actually saying it's not one or the other, it's both and. The, the policemen that were shot were protecting my nonviolent protest. I value what they bring. Like, it's both and, right? So somehow we have to detach ourselves from the opinion game that happens with news watching and Facebook and say, how can I serve Christian brothers and sisters that are more engaged with this and, and help them? What's the narratives that would help? What's the, and, and I hate that it becomes an issue of which side are you taking um, because it's not fair to either side, whether it's uh, police or the government or federal officials or elected city officials or African Americans or and there's other groups that would come into this as well, Native American and, and whatnot. And so, yes, we're aiming towards equality but until we recognize that we're not there, it's really hard to do deep work on it. And so that's a lot. Um, and you guys can disagree with me, please, on anything. This isn't about me being right. It's about pushing in all the way in and trying to have this conversation that we always avoid. I wanted to have this conversation on Easter Sunday. Pete's like, you know, what are you preaching on? And, you know, and I'm like, I oh, know this. And he's like, why, why do you say it like that? I'm like, because it's not what I want to be preaching on. And he's like, what do you want to preach on? I'm like, race. Um, why not? Why won't you? Well, you know, because that, that's not really what people want. 
and I like the church big, and I like that people like me. And, you know, there's all these reasons like, uh, but this week, this week felt like for me as I spent hours and hours and hours going over this, for me to be Jesus as best I could meant that even if my words are weak or I get some things wrong, that I try to sail all the way into the, the nexus of it, right? So that's the intention, that's the motive. 